Harry. Everything this year, our formation meetings, all eight of them, feature and kind of spring from Mary, but we're going to be talking about a variety of subjects, theological subjects, including a theology of Christ, Christology, a theology of the church, ecclesiology, a theology of our salvation and redemption, soteriology, theological anthropology, what does it mean in light of Christ to be human? Although the New Testament gives very little information on Mary, and there is little explicitly said there about her and what it does say, we noted some months ago, or weeks ago, that from the somewhat negative portrayal the New Testament presents of Mary in the book we call Mark, the Gospel of Mark, through Matthew, into Luke, and then into the Gospel of John, what we see and discern is there, there are signs of an evolution, a development concerning a theology of Mary. The perspective gets more and more positive about Mary as we go from Mark to Matthew to Luke and John. And this is the stuff from which the church built her Mariology. That is to say, a theology of Mary. Her unique role in the church and the story of God's saving love within the New Testament itself. The New Testament provides evidence only of a belief in the antipartum virginity of Mary. The, vir the, the virginal conception of Jesus. The New Testament says nothing at all about Mary's virginity in partu or Mary's virginity postpartum. Virginity in, in partu sounds bizarre for modern Americans. It means that Mary giving birth to Jesus without the usual biological disruptions. Sounds strange to us. But the church does maintain that Mary is virginitas antipartum, in partu, in the act of giving birth, and postpartum, meaning after she gave birth, she did not have regular sexual relations with her husband. She was, or with anyone, she was celibate her entire life, reserved wholly to God. On the contrary, the New Testament doesn't say, the New Testament doesn't say anything about Mary's being a virgin postpartum, after the birth, or in partu, in the act of giving birth. Sounds strange. The New Testament in Matthew's infancy narrative and Luke's infancy narrative does speak about her being virginitas antipartum, before the birth. The New Testament does speak about brothers and sisters of Jesus. I'm going to say right now, that is not an insuperable barrier for Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and even some Protestants and Anglicans who do hold to the perpetual virginity of Mary, that Mary was virgin her entire life, like our church teaches, officially. Even though it does speak about brothers and sisters, and we're going to see why later. But that's shocking to a lot of Catholics. What do you mean it speaks about brothers and sisters? It does. And there are extremes in how we address and deal with those brothers and sisters of Jesus as concerns Mary. Uh, extremes to the right and the left. We'll look at that. I have to say that Mary lived a life that was not celeb reality. She was a first century Galilean peasant woman, expected to work hard, malnourished, living in a very different world than we do. I want to start off tonight with a little passage from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 489. The Catechism reads, Throughout the Old Covenant, the mission of many holy women prepared for that of Mary. At the very beginning, there was Eve, mother of all the living. 
Despite her disobedience, she receives the promise of a posterity that will be victorious over the evil one, as well as the promise that she will be the mother of all the living. Hewa in Hebrew, the, that's the feminine for l'chaim, life. Eve. By virtue of this promise, Sarah, another holy woman, conceives a son in spite of her being barren or her old age. And this is the son who, through whom comes Israel, through whom comes David and the Messiah. I'm putting some things there, but they're being implied. Against all human expectation, God chooses those who were considered powerless and weak to show forth his faithfulness to his promises. Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Deborah, the judge. Ruth, Judith, and Esther. And many other women. Mary stands out among the poor and the humble of the Lord, who confidently hope for and receive healing, wholeness, salvation from God. After a long period of waiting, the times are fulfilled in Mary, the exalted daughter of Zion. Notice, poor, illiterate, peasant woman. Nobody whom we would think is great. But God exalts her like in her Magnificat. This is a very important thing the Catechism is getting at here. And here we can see the relationship of Mary with Catholic social teaching, social justice, and how we treat the poor, for example, the migrant. How we look at the dignity of the lowly peoples on earth, you know, the throwaway peoples, the nothing peoples, the marginalized, the not successful, popular good types. Mary comes from these and represents these. And Mary is tied up with the church and the kingdom of God as a symbol. You see this? So she represents these realities. The exalted daughter of Sion and the new plan of salvation is established. Where? In her yes, which is free. <laughs> 